One of my subscribers commented if it would be possible for me to make a colony style simulation, which is such a great comment that in a single line they actually gave me three different good ideas. Supply and demand gathering, colonies and city building, and something about ants? I think how cities form is a fascinating topic, and I would like to recreate this process through a simulation in Unity. People may move for whatever reason, but I think it is safe to assume that nowadays most people would move and live wherever they work. Therefore, this simulation will have three pieces. The units, their houses, and their work buildings. These houses will spawn around the city grid as it gets built out and the population grows. So, the next thing to do is the square grid, but I will somehow need to make it look interesting and fun. To achieve that, I spend a good amount of time creating functions that can generate these different floor layouts. And then, I spent even more time creating different patterns to spawn the tiles in. So now, I can spawn them in individually, or row by row, or even by circular rows. Wait, didn't that look weird? To understand this better, if we color each circular row individually, it becomes apparent that the circles don't really make sense at the lower values closer around the center. And this actually happened because the cells were two units apart from each other and not one. Why does that matter? Well, if each cell was only one unit apart, the furthest away square, which would be right here on the diagonal, would be 1.4 units away per square. To calculate what circular row a cell belongs to, I calculate their distance to the center and then floor it. So, this cell with a distance of 2.8 floors into 2 and then joins in the right row. Whereas, if the distance is 4, now the diagonal is at 5.6 which means after flooring it will join the group that is 5 minutes away from the center which is not correct. I was able to solve this problem by simply having the distance calculated for each cell and this was the result. Now the cells can also be spawned in in this fancy spiral way which was achieved by getting each one of the circular rows and then for each cell in the circular row I calculate the angle of the vector with respect to y axis then finally spawning them in starting with the lowest angle. On the topic of butter smooth animations, I wanted the camera to gently move in as the cell spawned in, but this felt off. And if you watch it carefully, this is because the camera stops moving in before the cell's animations are all complete. So now, if I match the speed of these two animations, it looks much better. A lot of the animations used in this project will simply involve iterating from value A to B, such as changing the angle from 180 to 0, or moving a cell from the position of 0 to 1. The easiest way to achieve this is by using Lur. But linear isn't the only fashion in which you can traverse from A to B. In fact, there are an infinite number of paths you can take. I think a better one for a smooth feeling animation is the cosine function, because it has this natural feeling ramping up and then a gradual ramping down towards the end. Here, you can see the comparison of the same animations interpolated with linear versus cosine function. Since these animations felt so much better, I thought why not use them for spawning in the buildings as well. I wanted to use different kinds of ceilings to differentiate a house versus a work building. So now our city grid is set, with houses and work buildings spawning on top of it. I love this little bump each building does when they are done with their animation. I think little touches like that seriously change the feel of a game. The traveling happens through nodes, where each corner of each square on the city grid is a node. In between each two nodes there will be a road. The reason why roads exist is because they will be the object to contain the knowledge about how many units are traveling on them at a given moment, and therefore how long it will take a unit to travel through them. In the actual simulation, the amount of traffic will dynamically change with the amount of units on them at the moment. But for now, let's just assign them random traffic amounts to each piece of road just to see if they are working. In order to visualize how much traffic was on each piece of road, I initially just used text boxes to a... Uh, I mean, it looked a little too crowded, so how about I just use some color to tell them apart? Which made me realize I don't even need the text. Each color can just tell me how much traffic there is. It would even be better if these squares were stretched to fit the piece of road they represent, which uh, looked like a shroom trip at first, but then I successfully reshaped the squares, then I flipped the horizontal roads based on their z coordinate value, and here was the result. I believe this was the best way to represent the amount of traffic instead of texts or squares. This minimalistic approach conveys the information to the viewer without taking up any extra space on the screen. And if you think about it, this is how common navigation apps do it as well, which further solidifies this as a good choice. For the next step, I tried calculating the path the units should take with the A-star algorithm, which initially wasn't taking into account the traffic. Ideally, in here it should avoid entering any red roads and travel around them, when it didn't work, I had to do a deeper dive. During this process, I learned that you basically need to have an easy way to estimate how much it would cost to go to a certain node. And when I actually displayed these costs on the map to visualize them, you can see the problem. 
Basically, once the agent reaches a node, it will compare the cost values to every other node around it, but if all the nodes have these inflated traffic values, it won't really work. For reference, this is how it's supposed to look like after fixing it. You can see that going through a red node has a huge potential cost increase associated with it, but traveling between green nodes is a lot less costly. After the fixes, it is clear that the pathfinding successfully moves around the traffic while still finding a short path. So the next thing to do is to add the units that will use this pathfinding algorithm to move around in the city. Now that the units are on the grid, I made them grab a random node and calculate the path to it, just so we can see if they can successfully travel towards them. Maybe not too successfully, since there were some bugs screaming at me. After fixing that bug, they were actually able to travel around without a problem. Overall, I really like the simplistic look of the units walking around. I think as the number of units increase, it will look really cool in a busy city downtown. Before I move on, I need to make sure that the paths can be overwritten, since this will be a required part of the actual simulation. For example, if a unit can't make it to work in time, they must cancel that path and then navigate back home. So to achieve this, I first implemented being able to cancel a path. The path they are on is basically a series of nodes. So when I mean cancel, I mean the unit cancels the path they are on, but the traveling they do in between the two nodes aren't cancelled. They must always land at a node at the end. So the unit stops their path once they safely reach the next node. So after cancelling their path, I tried restarting again to another random node, which wasn't really working. And this was happening because when a new path was calculated, the unit's starting node was set, then it would wait till the unit was done traveling to the next node, and then it would start traveling. Do you see the problem here? After traveling, now the unit is at a different starting node, so that's why they are jumping around. So I fixed this by changing the order of events, where if a unit is already traveling, it would first wait for the current path to be successfully cancelled, then it would set the starting node as the current node the unit was in to calculate the path accordingly. Here, you can see that the units are smoothly repathing without a problem. Actually, you might not be even able to tell if they are setting a new path, but that's actually the point. The new path starts smoothly, and I'm really happy with how the whole thing turned out. I really dreaded doing this section but it has to be done, the traffic. The road's travel time should increase as more units are on it dynamically and if a new unit enters the road, its travel time should reflect the present traffic. At first they were teleporting because turns out some roads travel time weren't set up correctly so it would default to zero and it would look like they're just jumping around. This was actually a good bug though because I decided to use this when they are rushing back home after failing to make it to work, which we'll see in a bit. Once I fixed that issue they were able to travel around fine. Since I didn't add the color changes yet, it's not apparent, but actually as they enter and exit each piece of road, the road travel time is being updated. So, for the next step, I added those dynamic color changes, which at first felt too snappy. So I tried slowing the color change down, but I kinda overdid it, because you can now barely tell if the color is changing. This led me to a rabbit hole, thinking about how it should work ideally. How should a transition work? What if there's another transition that starts, while one is still going on? I thought of the system that I think will work. A transition from color A to B starts. If a transition is already going on, this one will be overwritten by a new transition, starting with this intermediate color of the road, let's call it color AB, and going towards the final new color, color C. To see if this was working, I ran the simulation with many more units. Hopefully you can see how the colors of the roads are changing during the high traffic moments. I thought at first the busy roads didn't really have that heavy traffic feel to it, so I played around with different equations used to calculate the travel time with the amount of units on the road. At first I thought they shouldn't be linear, because a couple cars on the road don't really cause traffic, but then as the number goes up, the traffic gets much worse. So I switched the travel time calculation from a linear equation to a quadratic one like so. The thing is, when I ran the simulation with this new equation, you can see that the sum roads took an insanely long amount of time. At first, I thought this had to be a bug. But then I plotted out the three different equations I tried, the linear one, the steep quadratic one, and the more forgiving quadratic one, and then it became obvious. These don't look too bad at first, but it quickly gets out of control as the number of travelers go up. You can see that even at just 10 units on the road, the travel time is 100 seconds for the steep equation. Compared to the base travel time of just 1 second, 100 is way too long. So at the end, I decided to stick with the linear equation with the heavy slope, which seemed to work the best for all possible amounts of units during the simulation. So to see how the simulation will handle many travelers at once, let's make the units travel around randomly while adding 100 new units each time. Because the random node they chose had to be 16 units away at least, 
They just kept going from corner to corner, which wasn't really realistic. I wanted them to travel a varying amount of distance and directions, so I dropped the required minimum distance to just 4 units and it looked much better. But now there was another problem. Because they all started traveling at the same time, which meant that the moment they started traveling, they had to calculate their optimal path when there was no traffic around. To understand the problem here, imagine in real life if everybody got on the road at 8am sharp and not a second off to work. Technically, when we all opened Google Maps, everything would appear green and we wouldn't really know where the traffic zones are. So, to make the simulation more realistic, I had to add some randomization as to when units get on the road. After this change, it started to look a lot better. Ideally, the wait time between the units should be even longer because it takes them a little bit more time to reach those congested zones on the center of the grid. But at the same time, I don't want each simulation day to take forever, so I think this was a good middle ground. Alright well, now we have the houses, the roads, the units, the dynamic traffic, there's only one thing left to do, the actual simulation. Here's how I want it to work. It's gonna start with a few houses, a work building and a couple units for each color. The simulation will happen in day cycles, where each day is 24 seconds long, 1 second for each hour. They will start their day off by going to work. Each unit will have 4 seconds to get there. If they are not at work by 4 seconds, they will just run back home and earn no food for the day since they missed their shift. After working for 7 to 9 seconds, each unit will start traveling back home. And once again, they will only have 4 seconds to do so. If they can't make it back home in time, they will just order tech out instead of cooking, which is expensive so they lose a unit of food. Just bear with me here alright, I'm just trying to punish them for driving through traffic so they have an incentive to move to the other spots in the city. Once everyone is home, the night cycle will start for 8 seconds. During the night time, the units will consume food to stay alive. They will die if they are out of food or they will reproduce if they have a surplus of food. Then the new day will begin and the cycle will start again from the beginning. So here is how the process of implementing this simulation went. At first, I started spawning the units next to their respective houses. To understand the changes in each unit's food amount I added some texts, then immediately made them better before my eyes melted away. Here we can see all the units going to work, which didn't really work because they all had the same workplace for some reason. Once I fixed that, they all started going to their correct workplaces. And then I added the food logic, where if they make it to work they earn two food, otherwise it's just a frown for breakfast. The sleeping cycle at the end of today looked weird, and it also took way too long. And then I realized this was happening because instead of waiting for 8 seconds in total, it was waiting for 8 seconds per unit. So, after fixing those issues, this is how the full day cycle looked like. This doesn't really look that interesting, which is because no new buildings are being created, so the whole thing feels very repetitive and static. And also, I didn't notice this while recording, but the newly spawned units are instantly dying since their food was incorrectly set to zero at the start. Well, you know, problems aside, let's call this milestone the generation 1, where there are units, they go to work, they multiply, and they die, but that's it. For generation 2, I will start adding new houses and work buildings as the population grows. So we need to set some limits. Each house can host up to 4 units and each workplace can host up to 8 units. Beyond that, the new ones will spawn around the city. On the contrary, since units can also die, abandoned houses and work buildings will get demolished at night if nobody has been using them. I ran the simulation for some time, it was getting harder to understand what was going on at higher population counts. So instead of all the events happening at once in night time, I spaced them out throughout the night. This looked much better and it was much easier to understand what was happening to each unit. On the next few runs, one color would always dominate, which I thought it made sense at first, but then it got to a point where I was like there is no way this is happening. Then I realized it was because the new houses weren't picking their colors correctly. Even though, say, this house belonged to a yellow unit, it had a red color. So after I fixed that, I let the simulation run and I actually really enjoyed watching the city grow horizontally. It felt alive and interesting. But in its current state, it would fill out too fast since there was no opportunity to grow vertically. So, it is time to move on to the third generation which will include building progression. The houses and the work buildings can now host up to 40 people, 4 on each floor up to 10 floors. The algorithm will be a little more complicated now but this is basically how it will work. I realized there was so much capacity available at each building that the units would just reach an equilibrium where there would be too much traffic to keep on growing new units but at the same time because the houses were not at full capacity yet they would just keep spawning and dying in the same house, never really utilizing the space around them. To fix this I slightly tweaked the algorithm such that the units would still move out 10% of the time even if there was space available at their parents apartment. And here is the final run. I will be the first one to say that this simulation doesn't really give viewers some eye opening 
inside I was to the building or traffic and to be honest I don't think I even wanted that to begin with. I think it was still a pretty cool project visually and the fact that we just start with a few random units and houses and they end up building this layout that pretty much looks like a big city is pretty cool. Did you enjoy the extra emphasis and effort I spent on the design, the visuals and the animations on this project? Let me know in the comments down below. I believe this was still a good practice to always try to make your game look more snappy and professional with the animations and I will surely use some of these practices in my future projects as well. Thanks for watching, hope to see you next time.